Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hello, good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. I don't know if there's anybody anchoring this group with me or just me. I'm here with you, ma. I'm here with you. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Is that Femi? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank no you. Yeah. Yes. Hello, women of God. How are you all doing? We are blessed, ma. Well, thank God. Thank God. I hope you've enjoyed the morning session just like I have. Yes, yeah. we did. Great. So we are here this afternoon to talk about the women God uses in ministry. Do we have the chat function available? Yes, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, ma'am. Okay, maybe we should make a start then so that we don't get to run out. I just start by sharing a, a, a quick word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you for your goodness and for your mercies that we are enjoying, oh God. Thank you for this gathering today. Thank you, Lord, for refreshing us. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us what we ought to be doing. We are so grateful for every speaker that you have used since morning to speak your word to us. Lord, we thank you. Father, we commit this session into your hands. Holy Spirit, we know you have been with us since morning and you will continue to be with us. Please help us in this session. Go beyond my preparation and speak to your people today, Lord, that which you want them to hear, oh Father. At the end of this session, may we all be refreshed and may all glory and honor be yours. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Can anybody hear background noise from me? No, ma. No, okay. no, ma. Right. no ma. Thank you. Thank you. So today we are our topic this afternoon is to look at the um, to discuss the woman God uses in ministry. The woman God uses in ministry. I'd like us to look at this under two or three headings. Wants to look at what is ministry and also to look at the essentials for the woman God uses in men, what the, what the woman should have, the essentials for one to have for to be used by God. And I'd like us to start kicking off by when you hear the word ministry, what does it say? I mean, what comes to your mind? You can unmute and just say, what comes to your mind when you hear the word ministry? If I can just get one or two suggestions, what, what comes to your mind when you hear God's work? Service. Thank you. Service. Service, God's work. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And that's exactly what it is. You know, I had a, a look at the dictionary just to find out what the dictionary, you know, is saying about the word ministry. Because sometimes it can be a word that is overused. And we have examples of the ministry, like a department in the government, like the Ministry of Health. And we have a Ministry of Internal Affairs. I also found that the ministry was defined as the work and the work and vocation of a minister of religion. And is also defined as the spiritual work or service of a Christian or a group of Christians. He said, another one says the ministry is a person or thing through which something is accomplished. A person or thing through which something is accomplished. And I like this one, he says, a willful gift oriented and calling-based use of one's ability to serve. A willful, gift-oriented, and calling-based use of one's ability to serve others. And I just love that. But having gone through, oh, let me put a timer so that I don't go over time. So having looking at all these definitions, there's something that runs through all of them, excuse me, which is work done, service provided, so we, in, a, in, a, in a governmental department, for instance, with a call ministry, what do they do? They provide service. In churches, when we have ministries, what do we do? We provide service. Like the ladies we had this morning, uh, uh, Ovoy Oyovo, she, she's in her, her own ministry. She's providing service. 
So you're, you're very apt and you're very right. It's all about service and work. So ministry is all about service, service to God, service to humanity. And this is why we are here on earth, you know, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to serve, to serve in different, I mean, ministry takes different forms and different manifestations. Some people might see ministry as somebody standing on the pulpit, holding the microphone, speaking. That is a ministry, but it's not all. Ministry core is about service. And I found that ministry originates from a Greek word, diakonia, which translates service or support. So ministry is seen as service to God and to his creation, creations, God's people. Now, I want us to look at a few, a few points came to mind as I was, you know, going through this. And when we look at that definition that says a willful, and I had a look at that as an intentional. So you make up your mind, you come out, you choose, you intentional, a willful, intentional, gift-oriented and calling-based use of one's ability to serve others. And one thing that was clear to me as I was preparing this is that every single one of us, every single one of us have a ministry in us, at least one ministry. Some people have more than one, because remember the ministry, just like we all define, is service. Every single one of us, you know, has been called. Hello, Pastor Grace has been called for ministry. So every single one of us, every single individual, have one form of ministry, and some people have more than. There's nobody on this planet Earth created by God that has no ministry. There's nobody, no one was left out. And why do I confidently say this? I say this because God has given each and every one of us gifts and talents. There's no person, God did not make anybody void or vacuum. God has placed in each and every one of us gifts and talents. We've got natural gifts. We've got natural talents. We, you know, we've got also spiritual gifts and spiritual talent. You know, spiritual gifts in us at the time we accepted Christ as accepted the Holy Spirit. You know, we got given spiritual gifts. So this is what gives me the 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 the, 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 the why, why I say that every one of us, no single one of us, is without a ministry. Some have more than one, but at least one ministry. Every single one of us have a ministry. And then we function through this talent we're giving up. So ministry is what we do for the glory of God based on where he has placed us and based on the gifts he has, we have received from him. When we use this gift intentionally to serve others, we are fulfilling ministry, we are functioning in ministry. Ministry is about giving of ourselves. It's about being a blessing to other people in the ways that bring us purpose, fulfillment, significance, joy. I mean, we had it from the lady this morning, you know, she, she, she's given of herself. In fact, if she has more than herself, she will give. And in that she's fulfilled. So in, in doing ministry, in running in your ministry, you give of yourself to be a blessing to others, to serve others. And in that you're fulfilled. You're, you're, you know, you're fulfilling your purpose. It brings you purpose. It brings you fulfillment. It brings you significance. And yeah, I've realized that in life, there are some of us who have birthed ministries because of maybe traumatic experience they have gone through in life. For example, a woman got married and waited for years and years for the fruit of the womb. And after many years, she, she gave birth to children. And that woman decided to set up a ministry to be able to help other women going through that. I've seen other women as well, maybe lost a husband, went through so much challenges, but decide that this will not be in vain. So they set up a ministry to be a blessing to widows and all that. And some of that also, ministry also come out of passion, like the lady we saw this morning, uh, Miss Okiho, you know, out of passion, she was passionate. Sometimes ministry, you know, we bet ministries out of passion, out of, again, out of the natural talents or spiritual talents that God has given you, you birth ministry. The purpose of the ministry is for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus here on earth, because Christ, you know, he lives in us. So it was for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We can do this being in the, running our own individual ministries or through our local parishes where we serve. And that takes the next one. Our, our local parishes uh, is one of the 
wonderful opportunities for us to get engaged in ministry. And you know, sometimes people, like I said to you at the beginning, some people think that ministry is just only standing on the pulpit, pulpit holding a mic. That is part of ministry, but not only that, that's not the entirety of ministry. Through your local church, based on what you're, you're interested in, you can engage in a department. And I know what, I have seen people today who are, you know, who are, who are, who are thriving in the world and they all started from the ministry. I've seen people today there who are great singers. They started by singing in the choir. I've seen women who are running charitable organizations out there. They started in their local parish. So our local parish is a wonderful opportunity. And then to, for us to, to get involved in ministry. And it's so easy. What do you, what interests you as you come in? What interests you? Those are the, those are one of the reasons and one of the benefits of belonging to a, a local parish. And you know, so like I said, some people, they fine tune this and they take it out to the world because that's what we are called to do, to be a blessing inside the church and outside the church to be the hands and feet. And the good news is that Christ himself has equipped the church to be able to train and to bring up you know, people who will run ministries. Apostle Paul reminds us this in the book of Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. I won't read all of them, but you can check it out later. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. That's the good day. The church, God Christ has equipped the church to be able to raise up people who will do ministry within and outside the church. You know, the Bible tells us that we've been, uh, Christ has appointed apostles, uh, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And verse 12 of that tells us that this, you know, this uh, position, they are called to nurture, to nurture everyone, to nurture the holy believers, to nurture believers in Christ, to walk, to run their ministries, you know, because as a church, you know, in the community where we live, in the, in the city where we live, in the nation where we live, we must be significant. And we do this through ministry, through the ministry that you and I belong to, through the ministry that you and I, you know, open up, a, you know, start up in our, in, our, in our churches. And then we take it out. Some people have taken it out. So the, the church itself has been equipped so that it can raise people to be ministers, to minister, to go out there, win so to go out there, be a blessing you know, through what you have been, you know, endowed to do. Just, we have a, a good example in our midst today. You know, she goes out there, she does all what she does and souls are one to Christ. People look at her, lives are changed because of what she's doing. That's what you and I have been called. And our local churches are powerful, powerful, uh, you know, uh, avenues for us to get started. Because sometimes people say, I don't know where to start. I don't really know what I'm into. I don't know what I can do. Serve in your local church, come in there, serve. That could be your starting point. And I want us to look at the woman God uses in ministry, like I said, the essentials. What you know, what would make a, what what you and I should have for God to use us in ministry. And the first thing I wanted to say is that your home is your first ministry. Your home is your first ministry. And when I say home, home could be you. As a single person, you live with your siblings. Home could be you as a single person, you still live with your parents. Home could be your marriage, you're, you know, you're married with your husband and children. Home with, so your home, whatever you call your home, is your first ministry. I know and Pastor um, BC, you know, spoke so much this morning about the woman God uses uh, in the family. You know, I'm not going to, she has actually helped my job, if I may put it that way. So the home, our ministry starts with our home. That's our first point of ministry. And we must ensure, one thing I, I've written out here is that we must ensure that there's love, there's peace and order in our home. Love, peace and order, order thrives in our home. This is very important. I know that Pastor Bissi has said so much about it, so I'm not gonna go uh, you know, deep into it because home is where your heart is. When, you're, when you go out there, you're battered outside, you wanna come home. To peace. You want to come home to a loving environment. You want to come home to a hand that will open up and listen to you and soothe you, understand from where you're coming from, empathize with you and support you. So home, your ministry starts from your home. Hence the need for you to make sure that love, ensure that love, peace and order thrives in your home. And as you're a married woman, I mean, this, Pastor Bissi said so much earlier on this morning about looking after your children. Whatever your home is, if you're living with your parents or with your family, you want, one of your first thing to do is ensure that they are looked after, they are cared for. Your home, you're cared for. And one thing I've learned as a person, as a woman who's God is using a ministry, is that to keep my home 
in order to make sure there's peace and love, you know, there's need for me to put a structure in place. And when I mean by structure, I don't mean physical structure, just to put a structure, how to run your home. When you're there, you're not there. How to run your home. Make sure that your home is peaceful. Make sure that people, uh, your, your family members have all they need. So for instance, some of us have left home this morning to attend this conference. But we have, so for those of us that who have children, we must ensure that they, are, that they have all they need. And I like the way Pastor Grace has also said and Pastor Bissi has said it, about making sure, for example, if you're married, that you and your husbands are singing from the same hymn book. Your, your friends, you know, your, 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 your each other's uh, uh, partner, your each other's, um, you hail him, you hail each other, you cover each other, you support each other, you're there for each other. So when he comes in battered and bruised, he's coming, you know, he's coming to a, a, a peace haven. So making your home a peace haven is very essential. Because Pastor Grace said, he said, you cannot give what you don't have. If you don't have it, you can't give it outside through your ministry. So that is key. And I'll tell you why it's very important having peace with your husband, with your children. And I know she said that we must not keep malice. That is a no-go and you cannot. It's very important because you need their support to do what God has called you to do. I'm here this morning. I had to, come, I had to leave home to come and use our office in the church just because of the children and their noise. But I've got to leave them with their dad. If I'm not talking to my husband, will he be able to, he's giving up what he has to do until I return to make sure, you know, I've listed what they need to do, texted them individually, put it on a paper. But my husband has to execute that, make sure that by the time I come back, <laughs> that the school uniform has been washed because they still have a week, another week to go before they finish. So making sure that peace and joy, and that what is that peace? There's love between my husband. There's, you know, we are friendly. We are, you know, we understand each other. Even if it's your siblings we live with, even if you live with your parents, because you will need their help in order to go out to do what God has. In fact, I can't imagine uh, but, um, Mrs. Uh, Okiho, all that she does. Who looks after her children when she does that? So the support of those who you live is key. And a woman God uses must be able to do that. And also you must be organized. Organized, like I said to you, I left home this morning. I've put out everything where everybody needs to do because I want to come back to make sure that people have done what they've asked them to do. And you know, like everybody has alluded this morning, one of the gift that God has given us women is a gift of multitasking. We know how to juggle it and God has so blessed us. But the truth is that you can't do everything yourself. You really can't. You need the help of your husband or your brother, your sister, whoever it is that you have to help you so that you're, 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 they, they will free time for you to do the things God has called you to do. So that is key. Making sure that your home is a peace heaven. And I tell you what, one other reason why you must make sure that peace and uh, you know thrives in your home is this. I'll give us an example that the Bible gives us in 2 King 4, uh, the story of the Shunammite woman, whom most of us know very well. I just give us a quick background. The, the Bible tells us about you know the, the, this woman's place in the ministry of Elisha. Elisha comes to the town of Shunem to do the work of God. And each time she comes, this family invites him over to come and you know eat, refresh, and just rest. But one day the woman said to her husband, the woman saw that there's a need. Ah, what, what is, you know, it would be better for this man to just come and sleep the night rather than having to come and go. So they may say maybe Elisha came for a, a, um, a conference like this. And then after he, he will jump on his horse on his bike and goes home. But this woman said, this man saw the need that, you know, we have a room in our house. We can house this man. But she had to first of all, go and speak to her husband you know, to get agreement. So, there's a, so there are sometimes in our, in our ministry that we need an agreement with our husband to do what God has called us to do. And this is where the peace is. So if that woman last night had bashed her husband, called him names, how could she go to him to get this agreement? And they both agreed and they made up a room and Elisha could not come and stay in their house. And that's her ministry, looking after a man of God. So that's, that's an example of why we need peace in our home. Another thing as well is that we must maintain, you know, um, a balance relation, a, a balance, um, a, a healthy balance between our ministry and our family. One must not suffer in place of the other. So your family should not be neglected because you're doing ministry work, and your ministry should not be neglected because you're doing uh, 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 your uh, your. You should leave your family to. Uh, in, none of them should be neglected. So there must be a balance. And Pastor Grace has spoke so much today about emotional intelligence. We can act and put this in place. And another essential that a woman of God. You know, a woman God uses you have is availability, availability. You must be available for God to use you for what he wants you to do. If you're not available, how can God use you? I have two examples from us, from us, from the Bible. The Bible, you know, um, in, in, in Luke 1, 
about another story we also very well. When the angel came to Mary to tell Mary that she's going to be the, uh, the mother of the, the son of God most high. And though he greeted Mary, Mary was confused. She, she, she didn't quite understand what this is about. But you know, Mary agreed with the angel. Mary said to the angel, she said, whatever Lord you have planned for me to do, I will do. She agreed with it. And even though she did not, she, she didn't understand at that point what that all meant. I mean, I'm not, I'm not married. How can I have a child who will not be the savior of the world? But you know what? She agreed with the angel. She made herself available for God to use her. And I give us another example. And this example, each time I read of it, it gives me goose pimple. I wonder what kind of God do we serve? Sisters, we, we know the story in Joshua 2 about the, uh, the, uh, the, the Israelite. Um, when Joshua sent spies to go and spy Jericho, and they came into town, they lodged in the house of a prostitute if I brought it, it called Rahab. When I look at this story, I've gone over it left, right, and I am so in awe of God. God sent them to the house of a prostitute, a prostitute, sisters. And you know what? She made herself available, and God gave her wisdom. You know, for the, for the men to come to her, you know what that means? That's business for her. That's business come from heaven. But she did not go there. She hid them. She secured the life of her family through her action because God gave her wisdom. But God, why did God? Because she made herself available. She could have said to them, go. I don't know you, you know, because she, she seems to know them. When they came in, she knew who, were they, who they were. And you know, when the king heard what she had done, the king sent for her. And say, how dare you, woman, bring them out. She said, no, 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 they've gone. No. Ah, they're no more here. Ah, you guys should run after them. Follow that way. All lies. But God had God gave her the wisdom to, to produce a well-sorted story. The woman God used it because she made herself available. You and I can make ourselves available. Sisters, if God can use a prostitute, why can God not use me and you? Does anyone here, God forbid, none of us here does that. So if God can use such a woman, a woman who must have been written up by her society, a woman who must have been written up by her family. In fact, you read that story, say her house is by the end, by the edge of the wall. You know, that to tell you where she's been placed societally. But God used her because she made herself available. What can God not do with me and you? Well, you, you know, you will be amazed at what God will do with a woman who makes herself available. And I want to take us to another, you know, another point is that, uh, a woman whom God uses in ministry must have an intimate relationship with God who has called you. You must have an intimate relationship. You know, have your quiet time with God because 24 hours a day is not enough for us to do what we want to do. There's something pulling you, husband, children, work, ministry. Your know, 24 hours is, is, is gone, but you need to have time for your God. This is where you make fellowship with him. This is where you receive instruction. That's key. This is where you receive instruction to be able to run in that ministry he has called you. So it's very important. You must have a relationship with God. And this, you know, God works in a mysterious way. The example we saw earlier on, you don't have to be a body again to be called by God, but as God wills and he calls you, you know, acknowledge that, appreciate that and hold tight to that. Make sure you have an intimate relationship. No, let nothing put this asunder. Let nothing, whatever, you know, whatever it is, deal with it so that that intimate relationship with God is fluent, is not, is unrestricted. And you can hear from him, receive information to do what he has called you to do. That is key. And another point that a woman God uses, you must have compassion for the people God has called you. You must have compassion and love. Remember what we described, what we said in the beginning, as we, some of us you know, clearly defined it, that ministry is about service. If it's in the church, God has called you to serve. If it's in outside the church, ministry is about service. So have love and compassion for the people that you're serving. And I tell you what, when you love the people, it will be so easy for you to overlook hurt. It will be so easy for you to, like Pastor Grace said to us when they criticize, it will be so easy for you to take in that criticism and be able to work on it to get better. It will be so easy. And when somebody steps on you, it will be so easy for you to forgive them and move on, you know, when you love the people. And that's what's going to wake you up in the morning and put springs in your step. The love for the people, the compassion, the heart you have for the people of God, the God that God has called you to serve. 
you know we saw we, we we see a good example in the in the bible the the the, the, the deborah um deborah the judge um the, she's the only woman judge in her time in the old testament in judges 4 and 5 the bible talks about you know she took this position in the time that there was no woman judge she was the first she's a powerful woman she had come at a time that it was all men 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 but god spoke to her she heard god and she moved on she did not say, ah, God, I'm a woman, no, how can I do this? There, there, there has not been a president before. There's nobody like, she knows she didn't do that. God spoke to her, she took it on and she ran. And God said it was the heart in verse five, when she's now, you know, she went to war and she, God gave them victory. And she was, she was writing her song. She said, I read it for uh, Judges 5 verse 7. He says, hey, at the time, the you know, village life ceased, ceased in Israel. He said, until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. Deborah was a woman, she was a judge, she was, in fact, she was introduced to us in, in, verse, in chapter four, the wife of Lapidot. That's how she was introduced to us, the wife of Lapidot, a judge and a prophetess. So she occupied those three, she might have more. But she came in, she was, she had, you know, what was going on, she could not take it. He said village life ceased. That, you know, just take your mind right at the heat of pandemic, how dry the society was, your high street was dry. That was what Israel, or even worse, that Israel was having then. She said village life ceased. People were, you know, people, because of the, what the, their enemy were doing to them, village life ceased. But she came out, she said, no, Lord, use me. And God used her greatly. And God gave her victory because she did what God called her to do. So the zeal for the people, the love for the people consumes you. A woman God uses the ministry must cultivate a heart of a mother, a heart to feed, to care, to nourish, to encourage, to challenge, to comfort, to give charge if you have to. You must have a heart of compassion. A woman God uses the ministry must be bold, courageous, and fearless. I will say that again because I'm talking to myself. A woman God uses must be bold, courageous, and fearless. You know, when God, well, after Moses died, this is a man, but I mean, in, in Bible, there's no man and woman. God speaks to all of us around. God called Joshua. Three times God said to him, be of good courage, be bold and of good courage. Three, in three places, God said that to him. Because God knows that what he was about to enter is a tough and challenging uh, uh, task. But God said to him, be bold, be courageous, be of good courage. That's the way Bible put it. Be, be of good courage, be strong and of good courage. A woman God uses the ministry must be bold, must be courageous. Like I said to you, Deborah stepped out. She was called at a time that it was only men. And she was the first female judge. I don't know if there was any other after her. And she came out because it has not been done before doesn't mean you wouldn't do it. If God is calling you sister, step out. Like a lioness you are, you're the lion, daughter of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Step out. I'm speaking so emotionally about this because I'm for one that fear had, if not for God, fear had held me back for a long time. You know, fear held me back. I always thought I can't do it. I'm not good enough. People would judge me. I, I've forgotten that I did not call myself. And you know what? When God is speaking to you to come out and you're giving excuses saying, oh, I'm not good enough. Who told you you're not good enough? Did the Bible not say to you and I that we're made in God's image and likeness? If God is the lion of the tribe of Judah, what, what does that make you? That makes the daughter of the lion of the tribe of Judah. So why would I be, you know, it's held me back for years, sisters, I won't tell you lies. My, first, my husband and I took over this parish many years ago. And each time that I was called to take a prayer in the, on the pulpit, I said no. Because I'm thinking, oh, I'll be shivering. People will judge me if I stutter, if I smile. I will. Who cares? Who cares if God has called you, be bold. This held me back for years. I couldn't step out. I couldn't take the microphone. I couldn't preach. Ah, that scared the light of me. You know, but that is not right because you did not call yourself. That is actually a slap on God's face saying to him, oh, I'm not good enough. No, who said? You are God's child, made in God's image and likeness. That's what the word of God, and that's who we are. So step out, be courageous, step out, because you're not doing it by your power or your might. It is the Holy Spirit in you who is helping you and who will help you. I am work in progress, but I am much better from where I, than where I was before. And I thank God for his grace and mercy. If it was a couple of years that Pastor Grace called me, I would have said, Ama. I would have given her a very good excuse. 
because I'll be saying, no, 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 I can't. I stammer. I do this. I do that. But you know what? It doesn't matter. If I try, I fail. I learn from it. I have just, you know, I had had to, and I'm, I'm going to say this to you. Like Pastor Grace talks about self-awareness. Know where you are, sisters. Know where you are. Take stock from time to time. I've begun a personality development, personal development. I took courses, both free and paid. And I begin, and, they, and they, like I was saying to you know, one of our fellowship sisters, like Pastor Grace, the what the guy was saying, saying, they all came from the Bible. When the guy was giving us this point, I related to the Bible. And I'm saying to myself, Chinelo, you know this before. So they are not new to you. But why have I held myself down, always saying I'm not good enough? I'm saying to God, you have not made me enough. How dare me? But I have asked God for forgiveness. So please learn from me. A woman God uses in ministry must be bold. I mean, a sister uh, Oyoho told us what she went through. People she knew thought her own was too much. They left her. They deserted her. Was God not with her? Did she not from move from one room to five bedroom? Is it not same God? So you saying that you're not good enough, you're held, in, you're held back by fear. You're telling God, I can do it by my power. No, by power, by, by, by no man's power can we do it. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. What you and I have to do is identify what it is God has put in us. What has God called us to do? Ask God to help you, but step out step out so if you've got to take develop yourself if you've got to do courses do that develop yourself to train yourself because in, you know sometimes it's a mindset thing but by the time you develop yourself and you know get, get a mentor if you need to get one because a woman god business must be bold and fearless to do what god call, has called you to do and god will help us all another point i want to mention and I mean, like if, I, if I give you an example again of Deborah, like I said, she was a prophetess, she was a, 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 a judge. She came out at the time there was no, no there was, was only a men's war. But she came, in fact, there was one of our senior pastors in Redeem today. I believe she was the first female pastor in the UK here. At the time I heard this, her story that there was no female pastor, but God has called her. She stepped up and said, God, if you have called me, I will. Yes, they are all men, but I will. And today has God not used her immensely? God has used her immensely all over the world and God is still using her. So what about me and you? God can use us. We only have to give in to God for users. And another thing that a woman God must use, she'll have, you must be teachable and open to learn. You must be teachable. You must be teachable, open to receive instruction, open to be corrected, you know? When, when I, the first time I preached, I had to ask one or two people whom I know would give me one. I said, please tell me how I did. And one or two of them were honest with me because I want to learn, I want to improve, I want to get better. Pastor Grace, I'm coming come, come to you for correction afterwards. I mean it, Ma. <laughs> because I want to get better. No matter how better you are, you can always improve. So be teachable, ready to receive instruction. Also be willing to learn from people who are your subordinates, especially in this day of, uh, technology, social media. In fact, I had to call my daughter to show me one or two things, how I can set this Zoom background because I was struggling on my own computer. So I think it's the feature of my own computer and I had to use her. But she did it in seconds. One have been sitting down for hours, she did it in seconds. So you must be able, you must be open to learn from those. Look around you, all the teenagers in your church or wherever you are, call them. Some things you don't have to pay for it because they can give it to you at the tip of their finger. So be teachable because you want God to be able to correct you when you go wrong. And if you're not teachable, if you're not ready to take correction, how can God use you in ministry? So a woman God used in ministry must be teachable, must be willing to learn, must be willing to develop yourself, to know the skills you, I mean, who would tell, who, who would have told us that we would be on Zoom for over a year? Who would have told us that we would do service on Zoom? If somebody had said it to us in 2019, we would have said, ah, you know, it's a lie, we can't, we would have casted and would have bound it. But is it not, did it not happen? Did we not all learn, in fact, to, to even to use just Zoom function. I had done some free trainings. You know, some of them were being offered by central office. Some were being offered by other people in, in several church. Even Zoom themselves were offering training. I had uh, registered to do some Zoom uh, by Zoom themselves. A few training I did just because I want to learn how to use the function. So you must be able to develop yourself, be willing. In fact, Pastor Grace is so keen on this, you know, take it that people by now, we should have, every one of us should have an online presence. I know I'm a work in progress in this, in this bit because the focus of the world is shifting online and God can use you anywhere. I mean, I've, 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 we've had so many, eight, I've, I've, I've had a 50 year old party on Zoom, 80 year old party on Zoom. And I'm sure you too, you have naming, uh, naming ceremonies. Zoom is the world, online is the world. 
I found so many trainings on Facebook and, you know, I'm teaching myself because I, I've never had a Facebook account up, up until last year. I just, I just don't like that, you know, but there were things I don't like about it, but I know I can do without them. I know Pastor Grace is so keen on this and she's really pushing me to get, to get out there. And by God's grace, I'm working in it, you know, so learn, develop skills, develop, pick, and you don't have to pay for it. There are some people who would, all you need to do is ask or check or see where you can learn. Even like I said, like the Zoom, Zoom, the Zoom is saying they were offering so many free courses and all you need to do is just uh, register and you learn. So develop yourself in order to, to be able to function at any level God wants to use you. Another one, another uh, essential is that a woman God uses in ministry must be discerning, both spiritually and otherwise. So you must be discerning spiritually. Like I said, his intimacy with God is key because that's where God reveals things to you. That is key. That's where God will direct you, give you the in that ministry you're functioning whether it's inside the church or outside the church, it's key. You must be spiritually discerning to know what God is saying about the people you're ministering, what God is leading you. And you must all be discerning to know what is going on in your community, in your environment, in the town where you live, in the town where your church is located or your ministry is located, you know, in the nation, in the world, you must be discerning. You know, another example from that story of, 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 Ray, of Rahab is that when the spies came, you know, the woman was loaded with information. She said to them, ah, we've heard about you. The dread of you is on our, is on our people. We are so afraid of you. We heard about what God said it with you guys through the Red Sea, how you guys killed those kings of the Amorites, Sihon and all. We've heard about, so she was, she was perspective. Yes, she may be a harlot, but she was perspective. She was in tune with what was going on. She knew that they've come to take Jericho. And what did she do? She quit because of the knowledge that God had revealed, she was able to make plans for safety for herself and for her family, including those families who may have rejected her for what she did. So we must be discerning, spiritually discerning, you know, in, to, in, in tune with what is going on in our world. Because when you go into the place of prayer, you want to be able to take some of those things to the place of prayer because you want to pray, make sure that your prayer is current and it covers what is going on around your society. So spiritual discernment is key. And another point, another point, that another essential that a woman of, a woman God uses in ministry must have is patience. You must be patient and a woman of peace. And I say this to myself, you know, Pastor Chris has talked about emotional intelligence earlier on, about how you re we don't react, we respond. You must be a woman of peace because you're going to be working with people. You're going to meet in your ministry. You will meet with people of different temperament, different behavior. Even those you think you know better, sometimes they don't know any better. So you must be patient. I am number one work in progress. I put my hands up in the field of patience. I am one work in progress. But you must be a woman of peace. Because in that ministry, you will help people to put peace in places. So if you're not peace, and the peace I'm talking about is not the peace that your social security gives you, your job gives you your money, it's the peace within, peace that exudes from inside, peace that you have because of your relationship with God, because of your knowledge, of it. it is the peace that comes within. It's not the peace that your environment or the things you have gives you. It is the peace that surpasses, that was how the Bible explains it. The peace that surpasses all understanding. You're peaceful. Even in turmoil, you're peaceful. Your emotional intelligence is correct. I love that, you know, session, Pastor Grace, and I'm going to go back and, and rewatch. So you must be a woman of peace. You know, sometimes I wonder, sometimes I wanted to, you know, I wish there's a, I can, there's a telephone line to call Pastor Noah to ask him, how did he manage in the, in the ark? How did he manage to keep the lions, the lambs, keep them away that they did not kill each other? Because sometimes, you know, your, your ministry, you will see things. I wish I could put a call through to Pastor Noah and say, sir, how did you manage to keep that act peaceful? Give me some tips. So you must be a woman of peace. You must allow the peace of God to guide your heart, to exude from your heart. Because there are people who are waiting on you, to, you know, from your ministry to strengthen them, to support them, to carry them, to lead them. And you must be coming from a place of peace. You must learn patience. There are some people who are even working in your team. Some of them, what they do sometimes, you wonder, you say, God, is this person really with me? But God, God has put them there for a, for a reason. It's just my alarm, my time are reminding me. So you must be 
patient and a woman of peace. So I'm going to quickly go through the points that I have raised, the essentials that a woman God uses in ministry must have. And I've said that you must know that your home is your, is your first ministry. So you must ensure that love, peace, and that, you know, thrives in your home. You must, the second one I said, you must be available for God to use you. God cannot force himself. God does not force himself on anybody. You must make yourself available for God to, and, and you know, when you make yourself available, you can, you don't, God can take you to any level. We have two women in our midst today, the counselor, and we have Sister o, 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 Okiho, what God is doing with them. And you can see Pastor Grace. Pastor Grace is a typical example of what God can do to a woman who, in fact, sometimes Pastor Grace keep dishing out the program. I said, Ma, I love your spirit. Your corona, what, pandemic, what, it doesn't matter. She just, because she's made herself available I am so, you know, I am so proud and I, 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 I know I learn a lot. You know, when she's finishing one, one, one program, she's bringing out another she, because she made herself available. And what had God, God has just gone beyond her wisdom and her imagination to just use her. So that's what God is asking you and I. You know, God can use us at any level within the church or outside that you have ministry, the ministry that will be relevant, ministry that will change lives in our society today. All God wants you and I is to make ourselves available. I've also said that a woman God used must have an intimate relationship with God and you must nurture this relationship and nothing, nothing tarnishes it and is nothing restricted. It's fluent and you're able to receive fluently, continuously from God. And I've said that you must have compassion and love for the people God has called you to serve through your ministry, whether it's in, in the church. And I've also said that our local churches is a very good starting point for us to start because God has given us gifts and talent and we can use this gift and talent to be of service because ministry is service. I've also said that another point that God did, a, a woman God must be fearless, you must be bold, you must be courageous and that your boldness and your uh, courageous is not coming from your power or your strength. You're relying totally on God and you're allowing the spirit of God to do great wonders in you and through you. What I have also said, in a, for you to come out of your comfort zone, maybe I should just explain this a little bit more, for you to come out of your comfort zone, you know, it might be that you, know, you might need to take, you know, develop your skill, develop yourself, look at what you have and what you feel you lack, you know, you, you lack in your life, you know, take steps to be able to, to acquire skills that will get those out of you. You know, many things we, I, it's all about mindset, how we see things, how we see life through the various courses I've done. And most of those courses are online these days. You don't have to go in person. I've begun to change a lot of mindset. You know, failure, I used to see failure as something very bad, the end of the road, but I don't anymore because there are blessings. If you try that thing, you fail. There are blessings there. You can read, learn. You can be really, maybe it's a God's way of redirecting you, you know? So I don't see failure now as the end of road. No, it's really an opportunity to learn, to relearn. So you can develop yourself, look at things you can develop yourself with. And I'm gonna just um, list all this. So you must also be teachable and open to learn and you must be discerning. You must be, a, you know, you must have patience and be a woman of peace. So these are the, points I've listed earlier on about what a woman God uses will have. And I just want us to end with a quick word of prayer before we go into Q and A. Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for this great opportunity, Lord, to be to minister to, your, to, to, to us this afternoon. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, because we know that your word has come forth. Thank you for what we have heard. Lord, I want to lift up every woman here. If there's anyone here, Lord, who is not clearly sure, about what you have called them to do, Lord, please give them clarity. Before they, at the end, before we even finish this program, Lord, give them clarity. If there's one whom you have called and they are struggling in their ministry, my Father and my God, I pray this afternoon, Holy Spirit, redirect them, speak to them, draw them close to you, redraw the map with them and energize and strengthen them to do that which you have called them to do. Above all, oh God, may all that we do, may all our services through our ministries, oh God, be acceptable unto you, oh Lord, our God. Thank you, everlasting Father, for in Jesus' matchless name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Do we have any questions, please? Let me see. Is there any in the chat? 
Okay. Does anybody have any questions, please? Please, can I ask them? Yes, please. I just wanted to ask on behalf of the um, okay, on behalf of the single parent, um, how do they, how should, how should they undo ministry, uh, knowing quite well that you know um, it's likely that they are um, doing double job. So I'm speaking on behalf of single parents. Okay. Thank you very much. That's a very, very, very vital question. <clears throat> like you said, you're doing not just one job, you're doing many jobs just on your own. But the question I want to ask you is, what do you want to do? What do you think that God has led you or is leading you to do? If you know, what well, first of all is to know what it is that God is leading you to do and what it is <clears throat> you want to do. And the next thing is, how do you start small? You can start small. You can start whatever it is that God has called you to do. You can start it small because like you said, you're doing a lot already. And another thing is as you start small, continue to pray, God will guide you. But another thing also, you must have network, people who can support you. And what I mean, that, 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 that's what I mean earlier on by structure. Do you have, you know, look, do you have anyone who can, who can stroke, help you? For example, if you need to go out to meet people because of you're starting a new ministry, is there anyone that you can drop the children with? Can you go with them a day of age that maybe you can go? And the way you can, do you have any structures who can support you? That is really key. And that's what I meant when I talked about structure because there's a fire in your heart, a hunger to do what God has called. You know that God has called you to do. But then because you're on your own and maybe you have young children, it will be such a drag at the beginning. So one is to start small too. Check what you need to do. Are there any support that you can pull in to help you? That is key. And, that, that, and with that, if there's any support that can help you. And also, when, you, when you're starting, look at what you need to do. Are there people who may have done it before so that you don't have to do any, everything from the beginning? For example, if you're, start, if you're setting up a, 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 let's say you're setting up a charity and you need, um, for example, it might be so trivial, like letter templates. Are there people who have been in this, in, this, in, in this before who you can approach, who can give you some of the resources that they've already made? So you don't have to go from the beginning. You don't have to reinvent the wheel right from the beginning. Are there people like that who you can tap into what they have already done to do? I'll give you an example. There are a few times I have approached Pastor Grace and I said, please, this is what I'm doing. Is there, do you have this? Do you have that? Pastor Grace will say, yes, speak. To, you, 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 she will, she will, she will li liaise me to her PA and I'll get the materials I need from her. That saves me a lot of time and I don't have to go and redo it. So one thing I will say to you, start small, but also try and make sure you have a network. You know, people who can support you to do what God has called you to do. It could be your friends, trusted friends, of course. It could be your family, but make sure that you have someone who can support you, who you can lean on to support you. Does that help at all? Does that help, sis? Okay, okay. Do we have another question? Do we have any another question? Pastor Grace, please, do you have anything to add to what she, also, what, what she just asked as well? No, 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 you've done, you've done so well. See, it's done so well. I'm blessed that I attended your session. And I'm, I'm looking forward to marinate in the teachings and in, improve myself. So thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for the opportunity. Yeah, and if we are done, we can then, if there are no other questions, we can go back to the main room for the last okay. session. How do we go back to the main room now? We'll just leave at the bottom, there's just a place okay. there, bottom okay. left, um, right, okay. leave room. Okay. Yeah, it will take us automatically to the main. Yeah, okay. Sisters, do we have any more questions or are we? Otherwise, thank you so much. Thank you so much, you. For, for listening. Thank you so much for coming on. You have encouraged me as well. God bless us all. And may God take us greater and higher in our ministries in Jesus' name. one question, please? Yes, please, my sister. Yeah, because we are talking about ministry here. Yeah. I really appreciate your talk. 
because uh, you make it easy and it sounds so easy. But having said that, there are lots of people in ministry that we work with that are just difficult people. How do we manage difficult people in ministry? When you say people you work with, you mean that people that work with in ministry? Okay. Like uh, if you want to give a good example, let's say as Pastor Grace is our mother in the Lord in the church, she will not tell me that every woman in the church are easy people. <laughs> So, I would so. be one or two people that are difficult. Yes. So because we don't want to talk about difficult people, that's why I'm asking about it. Okay. Because you make it easier. See, if, ah, it's okay. I'm past. No, no, no. You know, like I said, I said, you know, we have to. Sometimes I, I want to go and ask Noah how did he manage in the ark to keep all the animals. You know, exactly. and what I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm not calling anybody exactly. animals. But sometimes people come with contact and talk about behavior. But one thing I've, you know, I've learned from the earlier session is that we have to hold our peace. That's number one thing. Nobody should make you behave the way you don't want to behave. And that's when it comes, when Pastor Grace talks about responding and not reacting. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes people behave and you just want to give it back to them. But in life, we have to pull back. Mm -hmm. Pull back. Sometimes reevaluate it. Is it really what you're responding that way? Because one thing I've also realized in life is that I can only control myself. I cannot control the next person. Mm -hmm. I cannot control how you will behave, mm -hmm. but I can control how I react to your behavior. Mm -hmm. There are some people who are so naturally gifted in annoying others and being mm -hmm. difficult. But the good thing is that you know that they are being difficult. So you don't react to them. You respond to them. And that responding to them majorly starts from you controlling yourself. You can walk away. I think somebody said earlier on that they will walk away. They will walk away at that point, at that heat, because there's no point. Whatever you do is reacting. You mm -hmm. can walk away and just let it and come back to it if you have to. Mm -hmm. Or you might talk to somebody who will need to speak to them. But what you must not do is to cause their behavior to make you to react towards them negatively. I control myself. I walk away. So I might go into the office, I point to the wall because I want to let it out. But what we must not do is to react. So if people are, if people, the good thing is that you know, and when you know, that's a good number. That's my, that's 80% of it done. You know. The question is how, now I know, how do I deal with it? You don't react, you respond. That response could be me walking away. That response could just mean you saying something softly to them or not even saying anything at all or letting someone else come in and take, diffuse that situation. I don't know if that helps. It really helps because uh, we can't come out of it in a day. So it's a, it's a, it's a progress things that will be yes. going from one step to the other, mm -hmm. from glory to glory. Because mm -hmm. uh, it is, at times I look at some words as in you can walk away, you can walk away. I hear that a lot. But I'm looking at our mother in the Lord, for example. She can't just walk away. She's coming for a service. And you are telling me somebody upset her just by the door. Walk away. Where is she walking to? But well, she can't start. If she, like you said, she can't start fighting the person. <laughs> <laughs> see, you see, in that situation, you have to walk away. Because what Pastor Grace doesn't want to do is to be angry on the pulpit. You know? So you have to walk away. You can revisit it later. But then you have gone back. You've thought about it. And you will never, when you come back, you will never react. You know, the anger, the, the hate, whatever would have cooled down, down and yeah. it will be a different reaction. Responded, let me just take that word reacting out completely. You can sometimes you just have to walk away. You come back to it, what you must not do is sweep you under the carpet. But by the time you've gone away, come back, there's a way you will deal with it. Because like I said, number one thing I like to say to you is control your own self. Because that's what you have 100% to do, controlling your own self. You may not be able to come to control the net, but your own self, you must before and in controlling that your own self that means do not react go come back deal with it you could deal with it yourself or you could go through someone else to deal with it and if it's in a church maybe there must be a, a departmental head i think we need to get back now since i hope i have managed to yes, help yeah, you thank you ma we do thank, you. You. thank you so god much you. pastor <laughs> pastor Chinel, god bless you thank, thank you. you i think we should just head back now thank you yes. all. Bye -bye. Yeah.